Um, so hello and welcome to Tracer's Takes on Feminism. I'm Jennifer Reeder, one of your hosts for today, along with uh, Carrie Rockland, who's back there behind the camera. Uh, we are feminists, uh, as, my, as it says right here on my suit here. Um, I would like to thank you, the audience, for coming to this important set of discussion, and all of the participants uh, and the moderators, and especially Shannon Stratton and Abby um, Satinsky from Three Walls for providing this location for this event within Faith Wilding's remarkable exhibition. Uh, so, this conversation is not going to get boring, but if it does, we've got the show to see it too. Yeah. Um, and uh, Faith, so tonight at Gallery 100 at um, 8 o'clock, Faith will be uh, reading from her memoir. So there's a whole, so there's another sort of extension of um, the show happening. And then I think even after that, there's a reception um, back here for Faith Media as well. Um, Tracer's Book Club is an all-inclusive social justice initiative made up of artists and educators and activists and otherwise fully engaged humans. We are all tracers. Uh, the discussions today will address feminism as it relates to issues of LGBTQ, motherhood, and race. Three different, not all together, but maybe sometimes. Um, these are very broad and in fact huge terms to deal with in an hour and a half, but it's a start. Tracers is dedicated to bringing it up, to calling it out. I predict that today's conversations will be provocative, smart, and emotional equally. This is an open forum, but a safe one. Let's talk about anything and everything. Let's exchange and embrace new forms of action. Issue challenges and reciprocate promises. Let's be all in this together. Tracers tracing. Uh, sign up for our mailing list uh, there, uh, over, over there uh, to receive information about gatherings and events. Uh, you can uh, find us on Twitter and Tumblr and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, the Facebook, there's a public page, but there's also a closed um, group that you can um, ask to, to join, which is a, a, a really nice sort of like um, a form for a change. Um, be sure to pick up your free Tracers merch before you leave. So there's the Feminist as Fuck prints, the Tracers pencils, there's um, calling cards, and then just general business cards. So those are all near the, the um, snack buffet. Uh, so yeah, those are sort of like help yourself, help your help self snacks throughout the day. Uh, each discussion will be about an hour um, of the participants' conversation, then about another half an hour of open discussion with the, um, the audience. Uh, but there are two blocks, so um, you know, use that time as you need. Uh, the first discussion addresses issues of LGBTQ and will be moderated by Lay Thumbs, your puss. Uh, who is an artist and activist. He also recently quit smoking. <laughs> um, Latham has work up right now at the Chicago Artist Coalition, so uh, be sure to check out that show. Uh, he will introduce himself further uh, and then ask the participants to introduce themselves. So thanks and let's do this. Good morning. Um, so yeah, I'm Nathan, um, and uh, I'm gonna try. I'm like kind of a, I'm a talker and a rambler, so I'm gonna try to not be that way. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, I organize a party, a queer party called Trans <coughs> Stances, um, which is uh, aims to be an inclusive, safer space for the varied LGBTIQ, etc. communities of Chicago. Um, and uh, I identified as a feminist since I was in high school, um, and uh, I have my own reasons for that, but um, I think it's, that's, that's, that's enough for me. So let's, uh, I want to have the panelists introduce themselves, because I think that's a more interesting um, way, and also I think it'll help you to remember like who is who. So, um, and I uh, use uh, male pronouns, but I also like they, um, and if we're tight, you can call me she, but yeah, there we go. So. I, I am Sylvia Malagrino, and I am an artist and a filmmaker, and I teach at the University of Illinois. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, nice to be short. I'd like to have whatever to follow. But I'm, I'm Amina Ross, and to be short, I'm, uh, I have my own personal practice um, as an artist, but uh, in conjunction with that, I co founded Third Language, and as part of that, we um, create a publication and workshops that are focused primarily towards uh, queer people of color in Chicago. Um, Hello, my name is Liz Kay. I also am an artist. I would say I'm like a mover and a teacher. I'm also a founder of Third Language, um, and I prefer gender neutral pronouns. They 
Can everybody uh, hear us? Yeah. Great. Awesome. If you can't hear, you can like just do this like motion. And that will signal us to Or or that. <laughs> stories or um, and it's a constant negotiation I think in language and how one talks about oneself and in what you know in what context one talks about oneself at a panel somewhere at a bar um, you know uh, inside group um, so. well I can follow um, with personal experience um, I grew up when I was growing up, let's say, uh, I thought that I was the only pervert because I was, I couldn't see around. I, I grew up in Argentina, so I, I didn't know that there were people who were gay. Only the men, for instance, because they were more visible in their gestures and their language, the way of articulating 
their sexuality, but most of the men were closeted. So uh, I, I, did, I wrestled with that, and then when I came to the United States, it was an amazing, uh, eye-opening thing. The first, the first time that I had, oh, I'm not a pervert, I'm not the only one, or whatever, because I saw the, um, the gay magazine in the, on the, you know, the, I don't remember the name of the time, uh, on the um, free magazines in the street where, you know, you can pick them up. And then I saw people with, for these games and you know so and uh, it took me a while to come out and when I did forget the rest but <laughs> <laughs> yes um, but in relation to academic feminism and I, I really I really I think began to open my eyes when I, I began to read feminist literature and that was mind blowing right but it wasn't academic it was feminist literature, literature, like um, May Sarton, um, Bell Hook, but she was later. So a lot of literature. Audre Lorde, uh, Dorian Saldua, and there are people who are, you know, not, well, they are in the way in academy, but there was something different than uh, women's studies or the academy. And, um, so, well, later we can perhaps talk about what academic feminism is or was. And I'm going to leave it there for the moment. Um, I think something that's come up is, uh, like, already a lot is uh, the idea of visibility, especially yeah. in the way that you were talking. Um, and, uh, and I think that's sort of a central issue. I, I, everyone here is an artist, um, and, you know, we're queer or LGBTIQ or, you know, somewhere in that spectrum. Um, feminists somewhere in that spectrum too. So like these are uh, the, uh, visibility and representation are like super super important issues to us. So do people want to like maybe speak to that a little bit more, or how they relate to that in the practice? Or um... I, I was thinking about that kind of in relationship to um, this idea of like queer theory, and I have a little bit of a science brain, so I can totally geek out over theory and like be really just into the ideas. But where I have, like, where points of kind of contention come into play is when um, the same relationship of scientists and object that's being studied acts itself out on people who exist in the world. And I think that I, when I heard um, Susan Stryker speak about um, some of uh, the works that she put together in the trans reader, um, she talked about this sort of thing that was emerging in trans studies of um, people, instead of people being studied, us studying ourselves. And I think that that's something that's really important because I don't think that um, we can go either, operate in this kind of binary with theory in that like either I'm going to be totally action or totally thought based. But how can thought influence my own actions? Um, and when we divorce ourselves so much from the lived experience, you know, kind of echoing what you were saying, I don't know what can come of that. But when we divorce ourselves, or you know, totally from taking time to indulge in this thought, um, I don't, I'm not sure um, where we can go with that. Um, and, and theory that aims to isolate people um, and is like kind of totally wrapped up in its own little ivory tower sort of situation, it is ineffective to me, but I do think that some theory does work, and especially um, scholars who kind of make their work accessible and create um, kind of doorways into, like, like Bell Hooks, um, like Angela Davis, like there's some serious heavy work going on there, but they also know how to talk to people. And so I think that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I also would like to connect to some of those things you said. I think like, the But then there's also the realities. Now, I often, often there's a sort of danger that can happen where, in theory, certain embodiment of queerness is more valued than, an, than another, that, you know, because it breaks the binary system more and all that. And often, certain people who decide for one reason to transition and to really live as the other sex, often that is, in theory, like often viewed as not as interesting as somebody who's in between. Um, and of course, Yes, I'm all about breaking the, bin the, the binary, but sometimes that's people's experience, and I think we have to consider that a lot. You know, I think 
a lot of the writing in the 90s, or right back past this version, was actually quite um, damaging to a lot of these people because they were reading it as theory, not as a Um, I think that um, thinking about what you all are saying about um, you know queerness and theory, <coughs> queerness and like reality, um, and I think both of those lend themselves to kind of a, um, a conversationally, but also like um, in a, and theoretically, but also like in a very um, real way, like to an expansive idea of, of gender. So how does that sort of expanded notion of gender, like? Um, from like feminism or from queerness, like how does that um, it, like how does that uh, play itself out? I guess in a way, or or how does the theoretical, um, a more theoretically expansive notion of gender from feminist theory thought or feminist theory and queer thought and queer theory like lend itself to like a kind of um, a more day to day experience that is perhaps more liberatory um, or not? Well, where I find the tension between Critical theory, critical engagement, and um, the queer community is in my art practice, where I feel like um, the conversations I'm having with my friends who are experimental filmmakers or conceptual artists is much different than the conversations I have with my queer community that's not making that kind of work. And um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times my work. A lot of people feel alienated from my work because they want to just be able to like get it really easily, and I feel like really bored by like both getting gender policed, but I also feel bored about art being made about gender policing. Like I think that like I want more. Like I I value the art that comes from like um, like a healing modalities, but I also that like they're like in queer communities and activist circles there can be like this ambiguity of gender or sexuality um, but often a resistance to ambiguity in art making or representation and then of course you go over to like the artistic circles and there's like a really um, I think an embrace of the ambiguity of content and, and like leaving things open-ended and questioning but then of course as we I think most of us would agree there's not necessarily a lot of <coughs> being done about like sort of our social engagement with the, the actual you know, with queerness or with like gender, etc. So, like, how do we kind of bring those conversations together, or like, what, or like, where is that disconnect, right? Like, why can't one, like, why can't we embrace ambiguity in like, in like the work, but not in like someone's gender, and why can't we embrace ambiguity in someone's gender, but not like in like art? Do you know what I mean? Where is that kind of tension? 
or like where is that disconnect happening? Um, I think that there's, for me, there's like a great um, opportunity with being an artist. I mean, I've never thought of myself any other way, but it's just that um, I don't hold this, I don't hold myself accountable to any person in art. Um, like, so that means that you can do uh, basically the, the ethics that I kind of leave for art is where I can push the things that are um, wrong or scary or not um, politically okay. And that is where I, that's kind of the, where I find anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not something I would do in terms of like uh, some, some kind of like both like civic engagement and like political and community engagement. Those things being separate for me are what allows the the art an artist to transgress, which is where I think some really amazing things can come from. Um, even transgress your own what you think is all right, you know, or right or good for the world. And so, for me to have those things um, separate for myself, that's when I'm, you know, um, that's when I find like the the whole field of discovery and. But I would definitely hold myself to a lot of other things, and I think that there's some there's there is some uh, area in between like language, um, which is to me where the where the uh, theory becomes like an actual real life. It's like not anything, it, you know, it's the most powerful mm -hmm. it, it, interchange. And so there, it's like um, I don't know when it's art or when it's <coughs> politics, but I for me it's very important to say like everything. Is out here because otherwise how are we ever going to find out where those things break? That's pretty interesting. Um, I guess when I was your age, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, I had a very different experience. You know, I was making uh, this documentary on the Inners and Feeders and I was really interested in doing this documentary because uh, I'd seen so much work, feminist work, and it's talking about the body. There's no men talking about their bodies. Like, aren't men in bodies? Don't they want to be like, well, I have issues with my body. Like, let's, let's do something like that. So I started doing this documentary, and uh, this man was great. He was talking to me about his experience and all that. And then I started asking him much more uh, directed toward feminism and, like, sort of, like, how does he feel in relationship to feminism? And, you know, and he totally, like, shut me down, and he didn't want to talk about that. And then he started saying a lot of like very uh, misogynistic things about women and how he's about masculinity and he's about getting bigger, he's about being something. I got really freaked out, you know, and then I was in the editing room and instead of, you know, maybe highlighting that aspect in the documentary, I actually completely removed it. You know, I was like, oh no, I don't want the documentary to come across as a misogynist or anything like that. So I was like, Kind of smooth out his narrative so that he would actually like say what I wanted to say about you know male's body and all of that. And so I, I think it's and of course it was in the context of the documentary and it was a subject matter that was really out there. But not in retrospect, I really wish you know I would have had maybe an approach where I would not have been afraid of the problematic, you know, and sort of have that as an important part. Um, to be honest, I've always had a really hard time understanding feminism. Like, I feel like growing up in certain like TV shows and <clears throat> cartoons, and then reading speeches, I've like I've like seen like people working from like a feminist point of view or like from a feminist like um, standing. And and now that I work with people who like identify as feminists, I can understand like what has <coughs> inspired those pieces of work. But I've never, like, I, I've always had a really hard time, like, reading um, the literature and, like, kind of wrapping my head around it in that sense, because it was, like, so divorced from, like, how I, like, was interacting and the things that I was seeing in my day-to-day -day life. Um, but I feel like one, one piece of work that, like, um, really kind of um, uh, created some illumination around it for me was uh, Ain't I a Woman? The speech, um, 
And I, I feel like that for me was the first time that I understood or like, because feminism to me has all, had always been like a white woman's thing. And I didn't know any black people or black women in my life who talked about feminism. I mean, they lived feminism, but that word never came. So I, I kind of just didn't see the connection. And until I read that piece, um, I like, I just like, it, the bulb went off. It was like, oh, okay, this is what I was missing. Like, this was what I had been waiting for for so long. So I feel like, you know, personally, I, I have never called myself a feminist, but I, I feel like inherently in the things that I do and the way in which I like navigate the world um, and, and the work that I make, yeah. But I don't know, I just wanted to say that because I feel like I always get kind of um, a little scared, like in, in groups, because I'm like, yeah, like, Yes, but then no at the same time, you know. Do people know that text, the uh, Sojourner Mystery? Yeah, Ain't I a Woman too? So, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Worth it. It's worth, it's very much worth checking out. It's really awesome, and it's, uh, and she read it um, at a convention. The first, the first comp, like, yeah. the national convention. Like, the first wave. Yes, um, yeah, the Falls. Yeah, and 1850 yeah. something. And I think um, what before the abolition of slavery, which yeah. makes it even more like really incredible. And it, and the thing that's also incredible about it is that it feels so still relevant. Yeah. So, so so relevant. Yeah. And <coughs> yeah. What did you say? It was like the start of the black women's series. Yeah. I mean, and I I had no idea. Like I was just like going through a book of speeches, and it was like it really stood out to me. Because also like I feel like growing up as a little black girl was also like. It's always like you're a, a black girl, right? And it's like that that in front of your womanhood always kind of is like you have to prove that sort of womanhood. So I feel like my blackness has always been like the forefront of my identity, um, and like just needing to um, speak to my humanity first. Like I am a human being, so like the the feminist part or the woman part, you know what I mean, was always like an afterthought for me when I was there. Adding to that too, my mom like is super identified as a feminist. Um, yeah, she's like really intense about it. And so <clears throat> the brand of kind of feminist fem feminism that she's interested in again was like built off of kind of um, predominantly like text by Black women. But also, I feel <clears throat> I feel um, her kind of understandings of feminism were I guess second wave. I sometimes so confused by the waves, <laughs> but um, like was like I guess second wave where. Um, she kind of didn't really understand my like uh, approach towards femininity and like kind of like scorned me for like some of like me indulging in being a feminine a femme. Like I identify as a femme and I get into the makeup and I get into like my hair and like the looks. Like I'm, I'm about it. But um, I also <laughs> understand that that doesn't in any way detract from my power or my like humanhood, you know? Um, but that sort of. Uh, branded feminism as well, I saw, like, tied to uh, whiteness in a way that I think, um, I, I've, I've read many writings on it, but I've also felt it in that black women are oftentimes denied femininity and that we're seen as, like, more inherently masculine and, like, intimidating and, like, big kind of ladies, you know? And for me, this sort of, like, fe like my sort of um, femme-centric personal feminism is a kind of counter- action of that sort of like um, that sort of thought and and me indulging in sort of things that would traditionally um, be seen as like anti-feminist from that sort of old view um, was, was really empowering and so yeah that that's kind of interesting as well that to spark that for me. <clears throat> if I have to talk I can say that I'm really interested in history and especially in in all histories, right? But in terms of feminism, I think what um, Prod is missing from what we are talking about is the history of feminism, right? And how it's connected to issues of power, mm -hmm. and uh, how, how feminism comes to be from the 19th century, early 20th century, with the suffragists, right, across the world. And then to the 60s or late 60s, what happened there? Once I had a student, and that was around the 80s, and she said, I hate feminism because my mother is a feminist bitch. <laughs> 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 What's missing here, right? 
right? <laughs> struggle against a very strict totalitarian regimes and they put their values and their um, yes their love their will against forces that were extremely oppressive dictatorship so those women never called themselves feminists but they had a feminist practice even though it was not articulated critically so um, when theory comes into play, I think the feminist theory um, forgot a little bit about that, that area in which women are powerful. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that, I mean, if the early feminists in the 60s, I think they located, I and mean, it wasn't needed, they located their uh, um, questioning in issues of power, equality, access, Right? Because you know, in the world, in the art world, there were no women in the in the galleries, in the museums, and so forth. So groups form, and I think they were very uh, necessary. And you asked something here about the separation between, you know, is it okay to have just women groups or men groups or something like that? But at the time, in the 60s and 70s, it was very important because the dialogue that happened in those centers, right? Um, kind of spread out. And uh, groups like um, the Gorilla Girls and all those practices that were totally focused or centered in the art world, I mean, they broke barriers. You know, they created something that uh, it was like, um, yeah, it spread out, it branched out. However, um, most of, I think, most of the women that participated were educated, perhaps middle class, and white, right? And it is pretty much, um, I think, the consequence of the economical and political situation in which these women were located in that, you know, forgot the blacks, forgot uh, Latinos, and, you know, but sooner or later, I mean, after with, with more critical insight, those views became formed. And that was important. Necessary it was incredibly necessary to later on, I think, uh, begin to talk about or begin to express queerness. And so I can see a trajectory of feminism changing over time, changing over history. And now, with uh, Jennifer, right, proposing a more um, open, open uh, feminism that includes men or includes uh, queers, is more inclusive and not so exclusive like it was the, seven, the, the, the feminism of the 70s. So I'm not sure that's soon. In relation, in relation to queerness, I think that the difference is that feminism, at least the 60s and 70s, was, um, was necessary to put forward issues of power and issues of patriarchy, and issues of domination, you know, and seeking that. Now, with women, something else happens, which is, uh, after all, that process, I think people became more conscious of difference. And after the, you know, uh, black feminists, Latino feminists came forward, that issue of um, difference became more conscious, right? So when it gets to define queerness and queer, through practice or through theory, uh, what is the point of queer theory? You know, to uh, to push the boundaries between what is considered normal, I think. So the activity is to challenge the uh, society and the concepts that the values that um, make society to, in a way, challenge power, but not, um, not uh, it, it, how do you say, not separating, not, uh, it's more inclusive, right? And it's more acceptance of the different levels 
of uh, lives and styles and sexuality and so forth. But I think queerness protects a little bit the question of power and people that can come more um, forward with that because it gets diluted <coughs> in the a persona sometimes a lot. That's it. I think one thing that's really important to what you're saying is an intergenerational dialogue yeah. that needs to happen. Um, and <coughs> reasons that it doesn't happen enough, um, but I've spent a little bit of time um, going to Michigan Women's Music Festival, oh, yeah. which is a, a women-only space, um, and in, in the past, you know, over the years, but especially this past year, uh, came under a great deal of uh, scrutiny and controversy because of their um, not including um, trans women. And um, what it meant for me to sort of go be me there um, was really complicated uh, because there there were and, and and here at this this music festival that happens every year in Michigan some of you probably already know about it um, that it's been happening for 35 years um, there is this what you're speaking about this sort of you know 1960s 1970s like radical mm -hmm. politics ha right. happening like mm -hmm. people talking about it and people meeting about it. Um, and the, there needs to be, I think, more intergenerational conversation around the people that founded those spaces and all of us here. Mm -hmm. um, but how to make that happen, I am, you know, I think this is this is some some of that hopefully. Um, but um, it's difficult because you can't you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a lot of there's a lot of important things about power um, and power dynamics as you were mentioning and creating space for each other. Um, that I think that still needs to be honored and then uh, complicated and talked about. And I don't think that that talking is going to necessarily happen in a really like easy way mm -hmm. or comfortable way. And um, sort of, that's one place where I think it's like, yes, this is, you know, this is amazing. This is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and this kind of thing all week that's happening to me and then kind of coming away and, and going home and talking, you know, with my partner about it. Um, and being like, well, there's some part of it that really wants to save this thing. Um, but what does that mean? You know what I mean? What does it mean for me to go over there and to be okay because of the body that I was born in, you know, and to sort of not really, you know, and to acknowledge that I have the privilege of passing, but that when I'm there, it's,
uh, categories yeah. what is real and what isn't real. Exactly. And I think that is like important to say because I think that happens throughout the movement in general. Like, you know, I was reading a quote from one of the one of the founders of HRC and, and the, the quote was like, over my dead body will trans identity be like um, uh, like like considered a part of the movement or something like that. And it was just crazy because I was going through like all these um, like uh, like founders of all these organizations now that like you know we give our money to and everything and I was like wow like cause I because someone had brought it up to me that like that a lot of the founders of these organizations like that like trans identity and like the trans um, leg of the movement wasn't like supported and that's why right now we're still going through that sort of like inclusion and I just think it's important to state you know what I mean because if you don't state that <coughs> then we're just like pretending that yeah, that sort yeah, of like support, extreme support. exclusion isn't happening and that why that's why the intergenerational dialogue it's is good. hard and it's a lot of trauma around that yeah. right it's like a lot of trauma around wanting to share in something so awesome like I've heard about I, I'm from New York so I never heard about it when I was in New York but coming here everyone's like you should go you should go you should go and then I talked to some trans girls and and I heard the tea about the situation and I was like why would you ever tell me to go to this you know like why would I ever go to a place where my sisters are on the side of the street protesting because they can't be let in it's like I think my queerness won't allow me to do that like my difference and like my understanding of that wouldn't allow me to even enjoy in that solidarity because what solidarity would yeah. be there for me. Why would I give my money, resources, and energy to a group of people who don't seek to do that for my community? So I think for me that that's where like I've always my understanding of feminism comes to like, girl, I can't even right, right. because right. the difference in me, my like brown skin, like I keep going on about like my difference <coughs> is always so heightened that like I can't negotiate the solidarity that I may have around right. some things because the difference is just like, bang. <laughs> and I mean, just jumping off of that, like what listening to you speak and thinking about like the way that the queer community is challenging power as not being aggressive enough. I think that like a part of, if I'm, if I'm um, paraphrasing correctly, I, I think a part of that is in kind of the sort of utopian thought that was like bubbling up in the 60s and 70s, there's this like, a move towards changing whole systems. And in a move towards changing whole systems, you've got to pinpoint a clear enemy and then have a solid front. <coughs> As a part of that like solid front, we're leaving a lot of people out. And I'm also not sure if there is a clear enemy. And so like I think that that this sort of like head-on sort of battalion approach isn't isn't gonna work for us anymore. And and I think that what I am seeing is like smaller initiatives that are almost sometimes working within the systems, you know, pickpocketing from the systems to fund their system, and like creating small networks that aren't as visible right now, but like even what Chances is doing. Like that is real, like in my, my opinion, real radical shit, you know? Like you're like ga gathering up money and redistributing it to people to make wonderful, powerful work. Like, and, and Chances, for, in my opinion, has a great platform and not a big enough platform for the wonderful reverberating change that I think it's creating. And I think that there's a lot of groups that are <laughs> <laughs> I, I, really think, I think it's a really powerful economic model. But I, I think that um, there's a lot of groups that are doing amazing work, but they're being talked, like we're talking about it over the dinner table and there isn't necessarily a public platform for them. Um, and we don't necessarily know the names of everyone who's behind the groups because we're not identifying ourselves in the same way. We're, we're kind of doing things a little bit low key. You know, we're not always registered as the not for profit and the half of it, I mean, we made up our whole own, I don't even know what we're doing with our taxes. But it'll be like, <laughs> Chicago, but she kind of couched the whole idea of like 
feminism as like a yardstick for how are we doing, and the way to look at that, she actually like left, she like named an example of someone she was talking about, um, an in incarcerated um, black woman, trans woman, and she was like, the reason that this is the most important issue for any person who thinks of herself as a feminist or who cares about humanity is because if we're failing this woman, then we're failing the entire principles and the history of feminism. And so for me, that's where it's useful. That's where it's like, I don't consider, um, I do like uh, uh, kind of center my life around this kind of queerness, but that's like, that's a privilege. But the feminism for me is this yardstick of like, if I, if we all have it wrong, if we're feeling that person. Yeah. So, to me, that's that kind of like answer like something. Yeah, you know, which, is, which is also the intergenerational and all the things that we're saying. But um, I can say, is this work feminist? Is this work feminist? Mm -hmm. Is this is this action feminist? Is this sentence feminist? You know, all this stuff. I can always hold myself to that, mm -hmm. um, and I and I need to because I'm, you know, uh, I, I need something that will ask me about justice and about. And, and to me, that that's why it, it has to be. It is about like. Um, Humanity and all those things, but I want to use the word feminist because it will drag up some things about misogyny and power and patriarchy, and at least at the, at the, at the base, in that one word, those things can be in the forefront. But I don't think there can be a feminism. It's not. It's not feminism if it's exclusive or any of that. Yeah. It's, it's a failure of itself. Yeah. It's a version, and it's it's part of the history, but it's it's a failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think like what's key to that too is like what I'm hearing from you is that this language acts as a yardstick and it's a structure to hold yourself accountable to. And that any sort of, um, I guess, movement or even disparate movements have some sort of structure in order to like, hold. And I'm, what I'm interested in is, and I have no answers at all, but what I'm interested in is how do we build a malleable structure because, I, I, you know, the trans women of color are definitely, I, I believe, our first and foremost priority, but I do not predict, the, I cannot predict the future and who knows what will be. I, and so um, in building this structure, what I think our critics can inform is to build a valuable structure so that that can always, our priorities always keep changing. Otherwise, again, we will lead to the dead. Yes. Yeah.